Hello, everyone. Welcome to Developmental Psychology, DEP 2004. I am Dr. Rivera. Now, ecological perspectives, or I say theories that have ecological perspectives, focus on the ecology, that is, the environment around you and how the environment is affecting you and your behavior and your reaction. And I want to talk just briefly about two of them. The first one is Bronfren-Brenner's. Um, and Bronfren-Brenner tells us that there are several um, ecological systems that we are always a part of. We have what we call a microsystem. Your microsystem are the people that you consistently interact with. Um, and so therefore, um, your teacher, if you see your teacher every day, is part of your microsystem. Um, your mom and dad are part of your microsystem. Your siblings, your friends, the barista that gives you a, you know, your coffee every every day. Um, these are all people that are part of your microsystem because they are part of your everyday life. You interact with them. What they say and do directly affects you. And because they directly affects you, well, then you react to it on a regular basis. Okay, I'm going to talk here about the mesosystem. And in your mesosystem are aspects of your microsystem when they end up having to meet. So for example, you have a lot of friends from high school and your friends from high school, they know you a certain way. They have an idea of how you act, how you talk, how you dress, the way you react to things. But now you're in college and your college friends don't think of you the same way as your high school friends do. Maybe they think you're a little bit more mature, or maybe they, they've they never seen you at a party and they think of you as someone who is actually quite shy or something like that. But sometimes you have to make these two worlds meet, right? Sometimes you're going to hang out with some high school friends and you meet some of your college friends. And you have to figure out a way to balance your personality, balance your identity, so that your high school friends don't think you're being fake and your college friends don't think you're being weird, right? This is a mesosystem. This is a, uh, when your two worlds here meet, then you have to kind of figure out how to uh, balance those two worlds. And this happens throughout your life. You're a different person when you're at home than when you're at work. And sometimes your kid is misbehaving at the market and you want to yell at your child and you realize that your boss or your coworker is at that same supermarket. And you don't want your coworker seeing you go nuts yelling at your kid. And so now you got to balance telling your kid to stop acting up while at the same time looking professional enough in case you're co-worker happens to pass by and see you um, scolding your child. That is a balance. When you um, bring your boyfriend or girlfriend to meet your parents, all of these are mesosystems. When you ask two different microsystems to meet each other or two, um, and you have to learn to sort of balance between those. Now, the next one you see there is your exosystem. Your exosystem are aspects of your life that actually you never see, and yet they affect you. And your exosystem are things that happen that, in fact, you don't notice at all. You barely ever see them. And yet they affect other people. And because they affect other people in your life, then they, they tend to affect you indirectly. For example, let's say that the school board is part of your exosystem. Why? You don't know who anybody in the school board is most of the time. And even if you happen to know who they are, you very rarely see them and you don't go to the school board meetings. And so you don't see what's happening. Um, you don't really care about them. But whatever the school board does affects your teacher. 
and because you see your teacher every day, well, that school board ends up affecting you indirectly. So that's part of your exosystem. Your mom's job, that's part of your exosystem. You don't know anybody in your mom's job. You don't know what she does, barely. Um, and, you know, every once in a while she talks about a friend or something that happened, and you think about it as she's telling you, and then you don't think about it anymore. And yet, the things that happen at your mom's work affect her. And because they affect her, they end up affecting you indirectly. And so that's part of an exosystem. Now, macrosystems are things that, especially if you are from a country or a culture where everybody has the same culture, everybody believes the same things, you never even think about them. The macrosystems are your culture, your um, government, your religion. They are things that were created hundreds of years ago, maybe thousands of years ago. And as far as you're concerned, everybody believes the same thing you believe. Everybody knows such and such. Um, and when you meet someone who doesn't believe such and such, you're quite sort of surprised by it, maybe even angered that they don't know how to do this or they don't know how to act right um, in this situation or that situation. In a country like ours, um, where we in fact sort of celebrate multiculturalism, um, we're a little bit more aware of our macro systems. You know, you know that maybe your culture is very different than your friend's culture, or your religion is very different than your friend's religion. Um, and so you're a little bit more aware of it. And yet, they are still things that were created thousands or hundreds of years ago. You had no say in them, and yet you have internalized them as true um, to the point where you're like, yeah, yeah, this is just what I think, and it's the way I think everybody is supposed to think. Um, and in a culture like ours, you might say, well, I know that not everybody thinks this way, but yeah, this is just how I feel. And you don't think, well, it's part of my culture and I accept that because my culture tells me to accept it. You just feel that that's, that's just the right way to do it. That's just the right way to think. And you think this is, I choose to believe this. But in fact, if you stop and think about it, you will come to the conclusion that, oh, in fact, the reason I believe this is because of my culture or my religion or my government or whatever the case is. Um, uh, your macro systems have to do with things that you have really no control over. They are passed down from generation to generation and you just internalize it because it's what was around when you were growing up. And the last system there is your chrono system. Your chrono system is a little bit complicated because they are differences in time. You and I are um, live in America. We live in um, Central Florida. And so, in fact, in a lot of ways, you and I are very similar. We probably believe similar things. We probably have had very similar experiences. And yet, in some ways, we're very different, right? Because I was born maybe, I don't know, 10 or 15 years before you were. Um, I grew up in a different version of our culture, and I internalized a different version of our culture. And so there are certain things that maybe I think are wrong that you don't even think about. I am incredibly introverted. Um, and you know, if I don't have to talk to someone, I often don't. Um, when I go to the supermarket, I say hello to the cashier. I say thank you. And that's usually all I say to them. Um, whereas my mom it will chat with just strangers, just randomly. They'll say, do you have the time? And then she'll give them the time and then spend the next 15 minutes to half an hour just chatting with a stranger, right? This is a part of the chrono system. Even though my mom and I are from the same culture, from the same family, we have a lot of the same beliefs. Um, because of the time when we lived, she was born in the 50s and grew up in the 60s and 70s. She's incredibly social. Everybody was social back then. 
being social was an important part of being a good person. But I was born in the 80s, and I grew up in the 90s and the 2000s. And I know how to get everything done through a computer or my phone. And so I find it to be quite rude to have to go up to a person and, you know, bother them with questions when I know that I can get things done faster without bothering anybody on my computer. And so those differences are kind of cultural, but they have to do with the way the culture has progressed over time. And so therefore we would call that a chrono system. And as you can see, the complexity of how the environment affects you. It's your microsystem, everybody you interact with. It's your mesosystem, how you keep apart your different little worlds. It's your exosystem, the people um, or the parts of society around you that affect others and end up affecting you indirectly. The macro systems, your culture, your religion, your government, all of these things that were passed down through generation. And your chrono systems, how the cultures have changed over time. And in this way, we can start to explain how people who we should expect to be quite similar because they have the same culture or because they were born on the same time, can in fact be incredibly different from one another. And how people who are quite different, and we would expect to be quite different, can in fact be very similar because they share this exosystem or they share this macro system. And so we can then say, oh, that's why these two people believe the same thing because of this cultural similarity that they share. And the last theory that I want to talk about here is Law and, and uh, Nahimos. And this is competence versus environmental press. And what this suggests is that how competent you are at any task, how good you are at any task, compared to how difficult that task happens to be in that environment at that time can affect the way you interact with it. I'm going to give you two examples. The first example of Sally. And uh, Sally sometimes plays basketball with her younger brother, Nick. And Nick is much younger than Sally, so she can beat him at basketball every time. Um, and so what's going to happen is that she's going to get tired of playing with Nick um, if you look at the graph on the side, what's happening is that Sally isn't great, right? Her competence isn't very high, but the environmental press playing against Nick, it's also incredibly low or weak. And so because it's weak, it's too little press. And so she's not really going to find it enjoyable and she's going to lose interest. But when uh, she plays Brandon. Brandon isn't as good as Sally, um, but he's still way better than Nick. And so when she plays him, it's still a little bit of a challenge for her. And she can actually enjoy playing against Brandon and usually beating him because the press here is just a little bit stronger. And because it's just a little bit stronger, then all of a sudden she needs to push up her skill level um, to beat him, and so she can find that enjoyable. Now, when Sally plays Ashna, Ashna is actually better than Sally at basketball. And so the press, the environmental press, is just a little bit stronger. And so now Sally maybe doesn't enjoy playing Ashna as much, but playing her pushes her. And in pushing her, makes her better. It pushes her to try harder. And so that game, if she wins especially, she's going to be a lot more proud of that game because she knows that she had to work for it against Ashna. Now, when Sally plays Martin, Martin is too good for her. Uh, maybe Martin is much older, and he's just way too good for Sally. And so um, when she plays Martin... She finds it is just too difficult. Uh, she, there's never she never finds a way to beat him. She always finds herself boxed out or whatever the case is. And so 
after a while, she's really not going to enjoy playing against Martin either because there's there never seems to be a way for her to win. And she's not really learning to get better. She's just always getting boxed out or she's always getting uh, the ball uh, stolen or whatever the case. Um, so again, what you're seeing here is that it's not just Sally's um, competence, but also how her competence compares to the environmental press. Let me give you another example. <clears throat> um, let's say that you are a high school student. Uh, maybe you are a 10th grader. And your teacher tells you to read The Cat in the Hat or something like Charlotte's Web. There's a good chance that you're going to find both of those books a little bit too uh, juvenile for you. The writing's not going to be very complex. Um, you're kind of going to see the twists and turns coming because it's you know it's they're written for children, so they um, they explain everything too much. Something like Cat in the Hat is just incredibly simple, and so there's barely a story being manifested as you read along. There's a good chance that you're not going to enjoy those very much. You might read them do what the teacher tells you to do, and then just sort of move on. Um, now, if your high school teacher tells you to read something like Speak or The Hunger Games, again, especially if you're a 10th grader, maybe 11th or 12th grader, you should find these to be a little bit below your reading level, um, but they're just right for you to enjoy them. And you might read it and really you know, find the, the characters interesting, the storyline interesting, um, the drama very interesting, because you know it, it's a little bit below your reading level, but it's still complex enough so that you can enjoy it. <clears throat> now, probably what your high school teacher is gonna have you read is something that's a little bit above your reading level. Romeo and Juliet, or something like The Scarlet Letter, which, you know, isn't incredibly complex, but for a 10th grader, maybe for an 11th grader, um, is going to be just a little bit more complicated than they are used to. And so they're going to have to work harder at understanding, but it's not so hard that um, you're going to lose the, the student or that, you know, the story or they're going to give up on it uh, because the plot lines are good and the story is good. And even though both of these are very old stories, they're kind of timeless. The characters are timeless and the storyline and the drama is still quite intriguing. But if I give a high school student something incredibly complex, like Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, which is a uh, book about evolutionary psychology, biopsychology, um, and how your genes affect your, um, you know, ability to be well, your ability to function, and how your emotions can affect your physical health, right? It's a great book, and it has a, a lot of great information. And there's a good chance that some high school kid might be interested in the topic, but the writing is just a little bit too much for that high school student. Again, especially if we're talking a 10th grader or an 11th grader. Um, they are going to have to read a whole lot, get into the chapter deeply before anything starts to make sense, before whole concepts start to come together. And, you know, the, the writing, if you're an older student, if you're maybe a college student or uh, a graduate student is actually really good and very interesting. But for that high school student, it's just going to be a little bit too much. They're going, even if they're interested in the topic, they're going to lose interest in the book. The Family, it's a great book about how um, government uh, works and how government is affected by, you know, rich people and people with power and people with religious influence. It's really a great book, but for that high school student, even if they're interested in the topic, they're going to have to read several chapters and get through a lot of characters and get through a lot of 
context before the story even starts to develop and before they start to be able to see the lines being created that make the story fun and interesting. And so for that 10th grader, they're not going to get through the first two, three chapters before they end up giving up, unless they happen to be just excellent readers, which of course happens. Um, But again, this has to do with how competence isn't the only thing that matters. What also matters is the amount of environmental press, how complex the task happens to be. And you can see that it can affect you to the point where it's too little and so you don't find it interesting, or it's too much and you don't find it interesting, or it's right in that middle ground where you can find it enjoyable or you can find it challenging. All right, everyone, thanks for watching. Let me know if you have any questions and remember that the best way to contact me is directly through Canvas. I hope to hear from you soon.